Welcome to my talk. Um, so this is a joint work with Christian Al-Rabar, Stefan Borgwart and Alisa Kovtunova from the TU Dresden on finding proofs for description logic entailments in practice. So this is a, a part of a um, conference paper we published this year at ELPA with the title Finding Small Proofs for Description Logic Entailments, Theory and Practice. So an extension of the theoretical part of that paper, the theory in the title, was presented yesterday at the DL workshop. You can find it on YouTube. And um, there's also a second part in this paper about uh, more practical aspects. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So first, a quick recap on description logics and ontologies. For those of you who don't work with these daily, so uh, what we see here on top is the syntax of a classical typical description logic. Um, you don't have to uh, read this in detail. I just want to give you an impression on how, um, how description logics look like. So the, the basic building blocks here are concepts which are composed using logical uh, operators using uh, concept names and role names. So these are basically like predicate names. And then uh, you put concepts in relation in an axiom saying that one concept is a specialization of another concept or that two concepts are equivalent. And by using uh, many of these axioms, you define an ontology. So this is a well-established formalism for specifying terminological knowledge. So there's also a standard called OWL used to define these ontologies. And nowadays it is used for many large scale ontologies to define um, knowledge. So one example is SNOMED CT, uh, a medical ontology used in many health sectors uh, today. Last time I checked, it defined over 300,000 concepts. That's quite a while ago. I wouldn't be surprised if the number now is close to a million. There's been uh, also a lot of recent additions relating to COVID. Um, looking at BioPortal, which is a collection of ontologies uh, surrounding biology and uh, medicine, we currently find almost 900 ontologies which define 12 million terms in total. But ontologies are also used outside of these fields. So um, there's a corpus of ontologies obtained by web crawling covering a lot of very different topics, which collected 21,000 ontologies. So um, there's a lot of description logics out there, a lot of ontologies, a lot of very large ontologies. And the more complex the ontology gets, the harder it is to understand what is actually going on in these ontologies and what uh, logical inferences we can perform. But it also becomes more important to understand that the ontology is, is correct, is doing the right thing. So uh, a typical reasoning task we perform on ontologies is classification which is to compute all logically entailed axioms of this form. They put two concept names in relation and say one concept is more, uh, is a special case of another concept. And this way, by inferring all of these axioms, we obtain a hierarchy of concepts. So what we see here on this picture is the, the OWL ontology editor protege. And on the left, we see such a, such a hierarchy as it is computed. And uh, it is well understood that you need some explanation service to um, use these systems. So if you want to understand why, um, why a certain intent must be inferred, you can actually ask the tool and it will show you a set of axioms from the ontology that is responsible for this entailment. So um, this is called justifications. These are minimal axiom sets that entail a given subsumption. And this is currently the state of the art of explaining entailments in ontologies. However, in practice, they are often insufficient because they can contain a lot of axioms and the inferences um, that are responsible are often not so obvious. So I remember this from uh, teaching also students learning how to use OWL that they often did not understand the justifications at all. And even if it gets large, I think everyone will struggle. So it would be better to understand how the inference uh, would be uh, uh, <laughs> how the inference was performed. So how I get from these axioms to the ex, uh, to the subsumption that I want to have explained uh, using simple reasoning steps, and this is generally known as proof. And of course, uh, we uh, were not the first to observe this. So uh, if you install a special plugin and you use the DL reasoner called ELK, you can actually ask for a proof for an entailment. 
and uh, explore it hierarchically as a tree shape proof. There's also um, uh, another graphical tool for visualizing proofs, which has been presented also yesterday at the DL workshop. So here we see uh, another way of visualizing proofs that is a bit more interactive. And um, well, these proofs are generated using a, a reasoner called ELK, which is used for computing these classification results. And what is special about ELK is that it uses a consequence-based reasoning procedure. That is, it uses a set of rules like a calculus to inform, to infer new axioms from existing ones. And this means that proofs are kind of generated as part of the reasoning process, which makes it rather convenient to extract proofs for visualization. However, currently ELK is the only reasoner that supports this type of proof generation. And this is a problem because ELK does not support everything we can do in description logics. So the standard description logic OWL um, covers much more than what ELK can do. And if we use some more expressive reasoners, we often end up in completely different ways of uh, performing inferences. So very prominent is Tableau reasoning, which is not well suited for explaining entailments. Even though recently consequence reasoning has also been extended to more expressive description logics, these systems that use this often um, embed this reasoning paradigm into other reasoning paradigms, which makes it very hard to extract the proof. It's at least not obvious how one would do that. Um, of course, one might also ask the question, why to use a reason, the way a reasoner performs inferences might not be the best way to explain to a human how to perform inferences. This was observed yesterday, also in some discussions uh, during the talks. So a big question is, well, maybe we don't need a calculus. Maybe we can generate proofs without using a calculus. And again, this idea is not new. So uh, Matthew Horridge, uh, presented a method for this in his th PhD thesis 2011 for computing so-called justification-based proofs. So um, the problem is, okay, you have a justification, you have some relation, and you want to explain how it is inferred. And what you can do is you can just generate all axioms of a certain syntactical form. Maybe you stick it somehow uh, syntactically, and you look at those axioms that follow from the justification, and this is now an intermediate layer, and you can again look for a justification for your entailment and see this as a, type, as a kind of intermediate inference step. And of course, you can do the same with the axioms in this now artificially constructed justification and justify them from the original set. And this way, you obtain a, a proof. And you can iterate this to have a more fine-grained proof. So, of course, there's a lot of non-determinism involved. Which axioms do I choose? How do I construct it? And um, what they use there is a ranking function that evaluates inference steps. And then you just choose the best one and you do a kind of a, almost like a brute force search to find to the best way of constructing a proof. So the advantage of this approach is, according to your ranking function, you're probably able to generate the best proof. The problem is, on the other hand, um, there is no clear inference principle involved here. So inferences are just performed in any way. It's not clear how to get it. And also it's relatively hard to implement this thing because it is actually a search in a big search space. And the result strongly depends on your ranking function. You have to know in advance what makes a good inference step. And well, defining such a ranking function in a mathematical way or whatever, is not very easy. So for this reason, we were looking at other ways of uh, generating proofs without a calculus, and we came up with something called forgetting-based proofs. So the idea here came from inferences from propositional resolution. So this is the well-known resolution rule uh, in propositional logic that performs an inference from two clauses on a, a propositional variable p. So one way of looking at this is that we are um, computing the inference on a specific name and um, eliminate that name this way. So one can use resolution to decide consistency or satisfiability of a set of clauses by processing names one by one and performing all resolution steps on these names. And if at the end we inferred an empty clause, we know the clause that was inconsistent. If we didn't, we know it's consistent. 
So intuitively, something else could be done in description logics because the axioms we're looking at use only two names. Uh, what we can do is we just compute all inferences on all the remaining names, again, processing them one by one until at the end, we have our inference we were interested in. And this brings us to forgetting base proofs. But first, uh, let me make more formal what we mean by eliminating a name or performing inferences on a name. So what we use here is the notion called forgetting. Um, what you're given is an ontology O and some predicate name X, concept or role name. And now if you forget that name, you obtain a new ontology O minus X that does not use that name anymore, but still preserves all the entailments that can be expressed without that name. So in a way, this is the strongest ontology that follows from the original ontology that is not using that name X. Which axioms to preserve depends also on the description logic we're considering. So um, if we have a more expressive logic, we might get a different result. And the basic idea is now just to uh, produce a sequence of ontologies by forgetting all the names that are not in our conclusion one after the other. Well, that doesn't give us the full method yet because um, this would not work well in practice. And the reason is that forgetting can increase the size of ontologies quite dramatically. We can have a triple exponential increase in size. So what we do at each step is we filter out unnecessary axioms that were inferred. And for this, we again use justification. So in each step, we compute a justification for our entailment, we forget a name, and then we again compute a justification to remove any um, unnecessary axioms that have been inferred. And now we can use a similar technique as for the justification-based proofs to construct a proof by just going backwards and for each ontology, looking in the previous ontology for a justification. And that way, we, uh, we construct a sort of um, tree of inferences. Uh, we can improve this a bit by also be allowing to skip a previous ontology. For example, it could be that two axioms are identical, then we don't have to include this inference into our proof. It could also be that two axioms look very similar, so it would be tedious to uh, include these simple steps. And this is the basic method for uh, constructing forgetting based proofs. So um, here you see is such a proof using uh, the typical syntax. Um, and what you see is different to uh, normal proofs. We now annotate inference steps, not with rule names, but with names, the name we're eliminating. Um, now of course, we can also um, produce a proof in a different way by just uh, choosing a different order in which we eliminate the names. And we see, okay, that uh, can result in a very different proof. And um, that brings us to another thing we have to think about when using such a method. The order in which we forget names is also quite relevant. Um, it could be that a certain order gives us a very bad proof and another gives us a better proof. So what we did uh, in our um, current implementation is we use a heuristics that allows us uh, to obtain nicer proofs in a more practical way. And I just highlight some of the uh, main points of this order um, the first one is that roles with non-trivial fillers are um, processed last. What does that mean intuitively? Well, a role usually occurs in a concept of this form where we have a nested occurrences of other names. And that means if we eliminate a role R, it could be that more axioms are involved in obtaining our inference. And this is not what we want because this kind of inference is still not so easy to understand. And this is why we postpone these inferences as much as possible. For the same reason, we, uh, we look at the nestings and if a name occurs nested in, a more, in another expression, we delay the inference as well. And finally, uh, we start with the least frequent names in our current justification. And this uh, has both the effect of uh, making the proofs possibly more understandable by localizing the, um, the inference. But second is also has the practical aspect that we delay expensive forgetting operations until they're not so expensive anymore. And this is also used in existing methods for computing forgetting that are not aimed at producing proofs. So we implemented this. Um, 
and a tool not only to compute proofs, but also to evaluate it uh, with other uh, proof generation methods. We implement it in a way that allows us to use any possible forgetting procedure, as long as they're compatible with our, the standard for specifying description logics and uh, allowing an easy comparison of different proof generation methods because we wanted to compare our method with ELK, which is the current tool for generating proofs. Uh, we use two forgetting tools, uh, Lethe and Fame. Um, these tools come in different variants depending on the description logic we're interested in. We chose those variants shown here. And one important remark, we used a relatively old version of Fame because with a more recent version, which is probably much better, we were not always able to produce OWL ontologies, which is crucial to our implementation. Um, okay, what did we evaluate our method on? So we focused here on proofs in the description logic EL. The reason is that ELK only supports uh, the description logic EL. Um, I mean, this in a way goes besides the original motivation because we wanted to be able to produce proofs for more expressive description logics, but uh, we need something to compare to, and that's why we focused on EL here. And as ontologies, we looked at the OWL Reason Evaluation 2015, which is a competition of a description logic reasoning system. And uh, the advantage of uh, their corpus is they already balanced the set of ontologies according to different criteria, um, like size, expressivity, complexity, and so on, which, uh, which is nice for performing evaluations. Now, uh, what did we actually prove? We extracted so-called justification patterns from these ontologies. Um, so intuitively, you start with a justification for which you then would produce a proof, but a lot of justifications would probably look very similar. So what we did is for every ontology, we computed all entailments of these forms that only use two concept names. These are the entailments we support. And then we compute all possible justifications for those. And what we end up with is a large set of justifications where many are isomorphic to each other or um, correspond to each other modulo renaming or replacing of concept, a uh, complex concepts by other complex concepts. So um, what we did in the next step is we abstracted away from these specifics by renaming or replacing concepts re resulting in a smaller set of uh, justifications by simply abstracting away what is there. And this way we extracted one and a half thousand so-called justification patterns. Finally, what we need for the evaluation is of course a metrics. How do we evaluate the quality? The first thing that comes to mind is just using the size of the proof. Um, if we visualize the proof as a hypergraph, well, since many tools visualize proofs in a tree form, we also considered the tree size of, uh, of the proof, if you visualize it as a proof, just counting the number of nodes. And finally, uh, we wanted to do something a bit more cognitive, a bit more clever than just looking at the size. And for this, we looked at so-called justification complexity. So um, justification complexity tries to evaluate the complexity of an inference by comparing, by looking at the structure of the axioms involved and this was evaluated also using user studies in a paper from 2013. And the idea is you want to measure some of the cognitive complexity of this inference. So this allows us to evaluate every inference step in a proof. Um, and we aggregated this uh, measure in two ways. One is simply summing up the values for all the axioms in the proof. And the other one is uh, measuring the maximal value for an inference with the intuition that the most complicated uh, inference is what matters here. So let's have a look at the results. So here we see um, uh, our results for tree size and hypergraph size. What each of these graphs shows, it compares the size of the proofs of uh, the different methods. So here we compare the forgetting based proofs generated by Lethe against those generated by Fame. And in these two graphs, we compare the respective forgetting based approach with egg. What we see in brackets is the number of cases where the value was largest for egg. 
So what the general pattern we can see here is that the proofs generated by ELK are in generally larger, though not always larger. And comparing Lethe with FAME, we note that FAME tends to produce larger proofs than Lethe. Why is that? So let's have a look. Uh, it's not easy, it's, it's not that difficult to see why this would happen. Um, what we see on the right is an inference performed by forgetting, where we forget a name R, and we get in one step from these two premises to a conclusion. Intuitively, what is said here is every instance of A has some R success of B, and the domain of the relation R is B, and from this we can infer that every A must be in B. Well, Elk now has to perform a much more fine-grained analysis of these axioms to first translate these axioms into a normal form and using different rules that are around, in, in, including the inference of tautologies and so on. But there's also other cases where the Elk proof is more compact than the forgetting base proof. So what we see here is an inference that involves a rather complex concept, which however occurs in an identical form in two places. So Elk doesn't go into this concept, it just makes an inference on this complex concept using the rules it has in the calculus. And this way relatively quickly goes to the inference we're interested in. If we look at the forgetting based approach, we have to now process every name here one after the other, which gives us a much more convoluted inference, which is probably not more human understandable. Now, there is even something else that happens. If we look at the proof generated by fame, we see it is even more complex. And why is that? Now, the problem now is not only that we have to perform inferences on each names one after the other. The problem is also that the forgetting based method tries to preserve as much as possible in our description logic. And since fame supports a more expressive description logic, there is more information it has to take care of. So um, these complex axioms occurring here use a lot of expressivity that go well beyond what is expressible in EL. We have universal roles, inverse roles, negation, and so on. And L would never produce such an axiom because it's defined for logic where these operators don't exist. So um, this therefore impacts also the uh, justification complexity or the cognitive complexity. So here we see the same graphs as before, but now using the sum of the justification complexities versus the maximum value. And we see um, that now sometimes uh, uh, using the Lethe based approach, the maximum inference is usually much harder than in ELK, whereas using FAME, it is the other way around. ELK produced more complex inferences. While this, um, yeah, we see a reversal effect that the uh, forgetting method used uh, has a, a different impact on the result. There's of course another way of looking at the complexity. So first, um, as already observed, uh, the inferences might look more complex because we use logical expressivity that is not needed. So Lethe has an optimization to reduce that effect. So if an output of forgetting can be expressed in a less expressive description logic, Lethe tries to produce such an ontology using some simplification rules, but that might not always succeed. And another way at looking at the complexity is by looking at the, um, the inferences that were produced. So we can, in a way, we can still see the individual instances of inferences as rules if we just abstract away from the names. And um, that way we could think there's a kind of underlying calculus and this calculus actually has a lot of rules compared to yet. So we, we have hundreds of rules here. So, um, so, but these are some negative aspects, uh, I think regarding size and um, other measures, we can still see that forgetting based proofs often look uh, nicer than the, the uh, elk produced proofs, but I think it depends probably on, on the use case, what we want to have. So uh, I'm almost at the end. So uh, to conclude, we presented a new proof generation procedure that is based on forgetting, where the idea is to repeatedly use forgetting together with justification finding to um, produce uh, a, a tree of inferences. Um, this allows us to generate proofs for expressive description logics 
without you having to use the calculus below. Um, as our result shows, this often gives us smaller proofs than, um, than using a procedure like egg, even though the proofs might be harder to understand. And of course, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, for example, we are currently using a rather ad hoc heuristics that was obtained by playing around a few days. So there's probably much uh, more clever ways of doing that. And also, um, what we are essentially doing is we are processing names in a sequential way, producing a sequence of ontologies to produce a tree-shaped proof, um, which I think there are more clever ways of doing that by not using a fixed order, but a more dynamic order of processing names for the different parts of the proof. Finally, there are some optimizations. So we could use this procedure to learn a calculus and then use this calculus uh, to produce proofs. And finally, it would make sense to integrate the newer version of FAME to support more expressive description logics. And with that, uh, I'm done. I conclude my talk and I hope you have many questions. Thank you. <laughs>